looked at on the astronomical time scale, humanity is at the very beginning of its existence. A newborn babe, with all the unexplored potentialities of babyhood. And until the last few moments, its interest has been centered absolutely and exclusively on its cradle and feeding bottle. It has just become conscious of the vast world existing outside itself and its cradle. It is learning to focus its eyes on distant objects, and its awakening brain is beginning to wonder in a vague, dreamy way what they are and what purpose they serve. Its interest in this external world is not much developed yet, so that the main part of its faculties is still engrossed with the cradle and feeding bottle, but a little corner of its brain is beginning to wonder. James Jeans, 1928. In any case, our three days old infant cannot be very confident of any interpretation it puts on a universe which it only discovered a minute or two ago. We have said it has 70 years of life before it, but in truth, its expectation of life would seem to be nearer to 70,000 years. It may be puzzled, distressed, and often irritated at the apparent meaninglessness and incomprehensibility of the world to which it has suddenly wakened up. But it is still very young. It might travel half the world over before finding another baby as young and inexperienced as itself. It has before it time enough and to spare in which it may understand everything. Sooner or later, the pieces of the puzzle must begin to fit together. Although, it may reasonably be doubted whether the whole picture can ever be comprehensible to one small and apparently quite insignificant part of the picture. James Jeans, 1928. Just reading these well, picking the right takes, placing them. Yeah, I, I don't think it pays to be too neat. You only leave some traces of us for the intrepid to find. What do you mean? Any visitor to that island is going to hear quite a lot of us, if they poke around. Oh well, yeah, no, sure, but I mean, showing what's happening behind the scenes a little bit, to ensure we keep some authenticity. Because if we get too concerned with saying a bunch of wise things in the least personally revealing way, then we're basically putting up a front, in danger of it becoming a false front. It's a slippery slope, and you know how easily we could slide into pomposity. I mean, nobody wants that, but would we notice if it happened? Or are we too close to the project? Look, I just think if we include some of our interactions, show that we aren't these transcendent, perfect beings, that we get stuck sometimes, we get into arguments or get depressed, then at least it's not a false front. At least, at least we're not hiding. Authenticity is good, yes, but you can find human drama anywhere. I mean, we're drowning in it from day to day. We're supposed to be building a quiet environment away from drama, not celebrating it. Look, these are objects of contemplation. These are about focus and clarity. We agree to the outset. Yeah, I, I know, and I don't want to change any of that. Just. Just a little added twist, you know, tucked away deep. It doesn't have to be drama, just reality. Reality. So what, we should record a meeting and stick it in? Maybe. But we already have some good stuff. Oh, like that little encounter the other week where you offered to buy a girl a sandwich? Oh. Her mic was running, so it's in the archive. Look, it's fine. In context, it's perfect, because we're not lecturing from on high. These recordings are part of an endeavor built by human beings. And they aspire to truth with a capital T, but we also have to remember that they cannot actually get there. We should be clear to the intrepid that we know this. I, th I think it'll make it better. Okay, sure. We'll at least see how it feels. I mean, on that island, we are going to be in very susceptible states. So, 
Be careful with it. Mm, okay. It seems I get to be the pioneer of being mildly embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, also, I uh, should probably let you know, I'm, I'm recording this conversation right now. Oh, come on. No, I'm serious. Oh. What? what? It, it, it will make it better, trust me. God bade me behold the sea, and I saw the ships sinking and the planks floating. Then the planks, too, were submerged. And God said to me, those who voyage are not saved. And he said to me, those who, instead of voyaging, cast themselves into the sea, take a risk. And he said to me, those who voyage and take no risk shall perish. And he said to me, in taking the risk, there is a part of salvation. And the wave came and lifted those beneath it and overran the shore. And he said to me, the surface of the sea is a gleam that cannot be reached, and the bottom is a darkness impenetrable. And between the two are great fishes, which are to be feared. Nefari, circa 970. What? I'm going to the store. Do you want a sandwich or something? You've been standing there for like an hour. I didn't want to interrupt. And I, I don't like sandwiches. Have you ever seen me with a sandwich? Why would you think I want a sandwich? Sorry. No, I... I need some sleep. It's okay. We're all working hard. I just want to read it right. We're going to be hearing this a lot of times. Every little thing matters because it gets so multiplied. It's good. It's already good. Thanks. Yeah. But we've kind of picked high goal posts. Every little bit matters. Oh, can you get me a coffee? It's just the new teapot beeping. It boils fast, but that beep bothers me. Moving on? So, next I want to raise this problem, which is that I think we don't have enough smart representation from materialist atheists, physicalists, anything in that neighborhood of ideas. And I've been trying to do something about that, but it's hard. The problem is that most coherent atheist screeds are focused on defeating some specific idea of God, or are angry about the historical activities of organized religions, rather than, say, from first principles, making a good case for the impossibility of any concept of God, which would be more like what we're after. Uh, I'm having the same problem. So many justifications of atheism devolve into assertions of the implausibility of Bible stories. Someone like Bertrand Russell, a very advanced thinker, but his commentary on religion all seems to be like why I am not a Christian. Very limited in scope. It is way too small compared to the vision of God and the pieces we're juxtaposing. Can you, can you repeat that last part? You kind of just dropped out a little bit. Oh, just that it's a very provincial idea of God that's usually advanced in those arguments. Sometimes even a straw man God. And it doesn't have much in common with the God visualized by Kuza or Spinoza or the great Sufis or even Einstein, whoever. So it just doesn't play on the same field. When people are explicitly pushing materialism, they're usually philosophers or writers, not physicists, not people who actually do the frontline work of understanding the physical world. With the heavy hitters in physics, it's very hard. It's hard to find good statements that aren't just arguing against straw men. And it's strange because in the modern age, a reasonable portion of working physicists are atheists. Not all by any means, but a reasonable portion. But it's hard to get strong and articulate statements from that sector. Yeah. I mean, the closest you get is somebody like Feynman. 
where science gives us a great degree of certainty about certain things. But outside those, it's not a good idea to tell ourselves nice stories and speculate. It's just best to realize we don't know yet about the bigger questions, you know, etc. But uh, we have a lot of Feynman already. Ooh, Paul Dirac was at least a staunch atheist at one point in his life, but I don't know if he has direct statements on record. I'll keep an eye out. Dirac was far from a materialist, though. He believed the universe is made out of math. That's an oversimplification, of course. He even mentioned God a few times in an Einstein kind of way. Wow. This is all so crazy, because among scientifically educated people, it's the cultural default, right? If you're a scientist or a computer programmer kind of person, atheist materialism is supposed to be the basic belief. If you're not a materialist, you're stupid. But if we can't find anyone who makes a good case for it, how does that happen? Well, it's easy to be convinced of the absurdity of stories in common Christianity, Judaism, whatever. And so if that's your picture of spiritual beliefs and you have an aversion to digging too hard into your own worldview, which most of us do, then there you go. Anything that seems religious is goofy Bible stories and materialism is anti-religious. And it's the general impression that smart people are materialists and uh, hey, I want to be smart, so case closed. Also, there are all these so-called spiritual people who believe basically anything and try to convince everyone. In addition to goofy Bible stories, did I forget to mention ghost stories, astrologers, spoonbenders, and all kinds of frauds? It's a ton of noise. It makes it almost impossible for an outsider looking in to see high-quality thought in the world of spirituality. If I can even generalize spirituality to one thing, so it's easy, if you're already leaning toward materialism, to see these flaky spiritual people, extrapolate that to all spiritual people, and say all that stuff is garbage. Hmm? That's how it worked for me. For a while. Okay, but despite all this, there's a large contingent of present-day real scientists who believe in some form of atheist materialism and whose beliefs have been carefully considered. So we need to ensure we respect that viewpoint. It's I so remember frustrating. That... Oh, sorry. No, 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 you, you go. Oh, um, I was just going to say, Carl Sagan has a good piece in um, Demon Haunted World, where he talks about science as a profound source of spirituality. But he doesn't mean mystical spirituality. He means just pure dedication to truth and the development of a wise perspective on our place in the world. It's nice, and it's a, a picture of atheism that isn't hostile or contemptuous. Yeah, I read that, and what you're talking about is a beautiful piece, and I tried to get it, but Sagan's people want too much money. Can't we just pay more? No. It would trigger a bunch of most favored nation clauses, and we have to pay everyone a lot more, and we go broke. So, no Sagan for us. It is a shame, since he was such a great thinker, and eloquent, too. Then the occupant of the first would shout to keep him clear. And if the other did not hear the first time, nor even when called three times, bad language would inevitably follow. In the first case, there was no anger, and in the second, there was. Because in the first case, the boat was empty, and in the second, it was occupied. And so it is with man. If he could only roam empty through life, who would be able to injure him? Shuang Tzu, 4th century BC. So, how did it go? I don't know. I, I don't remember. Wait, what? No, it's... it's not... it's normal for me. I never remember my dreams. If I try right when I wake up, I can just barely remember fragments. And later in the day, even 20 minutes later, those fragments are gone. Unless I wrote them down. And if I read them later, it's like, these are ramblings of a crazy person. Yeah, but then how do we know there are any side effects? I mean, do you remember everything else? About your life? 
It's fine. I mean, we're just doing suppression, not lobotomies. I mean, everything is still there. In dreams, we often take on personalities that are a little different. We forget details of our waking life and remember fictions in their place. How does that happen? Well, we're just using the same pathways. That's fine. But really, how should I know if something's missing? If you forget a few random little things, how would you remember that you forgot? Nothing big is missing. I don't think. Wait, who are you again? <laughs> oh God, why did we let you go first? <laughs> first hasn't happened yet. I was just dipping my toes into the pool. Real first happens when someone dives right in and gets to decide for themselves when to come out. Who's that gonna be? You? Ugh. I long for the days when we weren't sure we'd be doing anything this scary. It'll be fine. It's not scary. It'll be fun. So fun you don't even remember? <laughs> okay, no. Shoo. I, I wanna re-record this one before I go home. I have some new ideas about it. What? Because of the test? Yes. Because of the test. Um, possibly. I thought you didn't remember anything. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night. I'll see you tomorrow. I cannot understand why we idle discussing religion. If we are honest, and scientists have to be, we must admit that religion is a jumble of false assertions with no basis in reality. The very idea of God is a product of the human imagination. It is quite understandable why primitive people, who are so much more exposed to the overpowering forces of nature than we are today, should have personified these forces in fear and trembling. But nowadays, when we understand so many natural processes, we have no need for such solutions. I can't for the life of me see how the postulate of an almighty God helps us in any way. What I do see is that this assumption leads to such unproductive questions as to why God allows so much misery and injustice the exploitation of the poor by the rich, and all the other horrors he might have prevented. If religion is still being taught, it is by no means because its ideas still convince us, but simply because some of us want to keep the lower classes quiet. Quiet people are much easier to govern than clamorous and dissatisfied ones. They are also much easier to exploit. Religion is a kind of opium, that allows a nation to lull itself into wishful dreams and so forget the injustices that are being perpetrated against the people. Paul Dirac, 1927, as related by Werner Heisenberg. So, you see what I'm saying here? Yep, this one doesn't fit either. How would you characterize the way in which it doesn't fit? Well, it's about arguing and it's about being greatly disturbed by issues that are relatively small. It's not aiming high, and it's not about ultimate truth, not really. It's mostly about what some stupid people are doing that is wrong compared to what I am doing that is right. But Paul Dirac was definitely a truth seeker, in the domain of physics at least. Yeah, but I don't feel that attitude in this piece at all. If a belief is just formed in opposition to other beliefs, it can't be fundamental. It can't be that deep. But, you know, where he says the thing about natural processes, he starts to outline an actual philosophy. Hmm, interesting. There's something that could stand on its own, that it isn't just rejection and opposition. But then he drops it. Well, this isn't the atheist manifesto we need. I'll keep looking. Okay. You know, at one point, Dirac also wrote this. One could perhaps describe the situation by saying that God is a mathematician of a very high order, and he used very advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. I think he meant God in an Einstein kind of way. Hmm. He said that? 
Same guy. Same guy. Later in life, though. Yeah, people are strange. Scientists are stranger. <laughs> yes, they are. I thought my voyage had come to its end. At the last limit of my power. That the path before me was closed. The provisions exhausted. And the time come to take shelter in silent obscurity. But I find that thy will knows no end in me. And when words die out on the tongue, new melodies break forth from the heart. And where old tracks are lost, new country is revealed with its wonders.